I came to the University of Cincinnati in 1984 as a graduate student in engineering, having graduated from the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. When I came here, I started bonding with the local Indian community. It was a small community then. The awareness about India was not as much then as it is now. And I then started attending concerts at CCM, and it opened up a new world to me. I was trained in Indian classical music and Carnatic music in the world of ragas that had never seen a formal concert of Western classical music. So what I saw here at CCM just amazed me. I started listening to more, I just wanted more. I just started listening to GUC and a lot of other record collections here in the area. And soon enough, I wanted to write my own music, which would combine the idea of Indian ragas with Western orchestration. So I trained myself in MIDI and in orchestration and started writing music and released my first album in 1992. Then a friend of mine said, hey, Connix, you should start a choir. So I got hold of 20 friends of mine and taught them music and taught them the layered, structured music that I had written for a choir, and thus was born the very first Indian-American choir in the United States right here in Cincinnati. Then we, as a university community, pulled together a bunch of dancers and worked together for several weeks to come up with the very first musical theater production, Basant, a celebration of spring, which was performed right here on this stage in 1994. Basant was a huge success. But the more, the more important thing is that it opened up a world, opened me up to a world that, that I was not prepared for. It opened me up to a world of community and music that enabled me and everybody whom I worked with in the last 20 years to rise beyond our wildest imagination. So, uh, in 1996, I, met, I, I worked with Dr. Catherine Roma and wrote a musical theater production called The Blue Jewel. Together with Kathy Roma, we, we produced a new sound, that of Indian voices who sang here, along with singers from, al along with a few Western choirs here in Cincinnati. But beyond the fact that we produced a new sound, we also created a new community interaction that had never been done anywhere else in the United States before. So, two diverse communities working together, Western singers reading and belting out Indian ragas from a score, Indian singers memorizing and singing Western parts, and then uh, uh, we all made music together, we broke bread together, we bonded together, we made lifelong friendships and built an era of collaboration. And needless to say, the Blue Jewel was a huge success, and it was repeated again at the Emory Theater and in Clermont County. Fast forward to, 19, fast forward to 2002. 9-11 had happened. The world was a different place. Even Cincinnati was different. So Kathy and I met at uh, Starbucks on 4th and Vine, and she said, Connix, you need to write a new work, a work on universal peace. So I started writing a new work, an oratorio called Shanti, A Journey of Peace, which on one hand tells the story of Indian cultural history, but on the other hand gives a message of interconnectedness and the idea of universal peace, which is common to all of humanity. I wrote Shanti for a 150-member choir, and I need a, needed 100 Indian voices to sing it. Where would I go looking for these voices? I expressed this idea to my wife, and she said I was crazy. And everybody around me confirmed that I was crazy. Yeah, but I, that didn't stop me. I went knocking on doors and asking for singers. I found singers, and I found coachable singers. I found people who could not sing, who had not sung before, but were willing to be coached. And together, we built a choir of about 90 singers of Indian origin. And uh, we started working with Kathy Roma, who brought in the Martin Luther King Coalition Chorale, and uh, Muse, and St. John's Unitarian Church. And together, we had about 150 singers. And we, when we started re rehearsing together, it opened up a new world for us.
if this was the energy that was generated during a rehearsal, imagine what happened in the performance. We performed, we premiered Shanti at Great Hall TUC, two shows back to back. And it was a huge success, and a lot of energy was generated in the auditorium. And not only that, we were invited to perform Shanti again at the, at the Aronoff Center, downtown Cincinnati, in the year 2006. And we did that. We had an audience of 2,600 people who gave a five-minute long standing ovation to the end to a cast of about 250 people standing on stage. It was a mixture of professional orchestra players, professional singers, and amateur singers, people that had not sung before, leave alone having sung on the stage at the Aronoff Center. So it was an exhilarating moment. Clearly, we had touched mood and inspired the audience as, as, well, as well as the performers. Nobody wanted this moment, moment to end at all. And when the curtains came down, you should see the energy behind stage. People were just hugging each other, smiling, crying, laughing. It was just wild with energy. So at that point in time, I said, I don't want to let go of this. I want to keep doing this again and again and again. And I also realized that what was driving me was not just music alone. It was about community. I realized that who I was was the possibility of peace and joy through community and music. I also realized that when you get a group of a diverse group of singers together in a room and have them sing chants for peace, the air around us changes. And also, the message of the intentionality of the message of peace gets communicated very powerfully to the universe. I also realized that projects such as these bring the best out in people. There was a tremendous amount of diversity in the choir in terms of ethnicity, age, and anything you can think of. There was even a pregnant physician in the choir whose due date was the performance date of Shanti. She, yeah, well, she didn't deliver, of course. And if she had delivered on stage, we would have named the baby Shanti. <laughs> yeah, and uh, there was a tremendous sense of community. There was a singer north of 80 years old who almost passed out during a rehearsal, and you should, you should have seen all the physicians in the choir rush to her first aid. Okay, so uh, the same kind of feeling, the energy, the excitement was experienced by every single member in the choir who just wanted to do this over and over again. And I think this is just a fantastic step forward. It brings Eastern and Western part together. I was really astonished by the amount of energy it generates. It's a very diverse group of people. We all part of the Shanti because we feel connected. But here, the sound I feel is something totally unique, and totally, you know, it is it's totally different. The energy comes from the excitement that the music engenders in people. It's like a, a, a great fellowship. You know, it's excitement. And there's a lot of things you probably have never heard and maybe never will hear, you know, again. You don't have to understand the words to, under, to, to feel, you know, what the music is saying. So Shanti was huge. And uh, we, at that point in time, we could never dream of the idea that it could be taken to other places in the United States. But all I had to do was to play this video of Shanti to a friend of mine in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and he said, we have to do it here. There was no way, we could, no way we could take 150 people from here to go all the way there to perform Shanti. But then, Delta had a hub here in Cincinnati, which it doesn't anymore. So there were, there were like four flights to Allentown, Pennsylvania, so I flew back and forth many different times, and we built an Indian community choir in Allentown, Pennsylvania, in Lehigh Valley, which quickly took ownership of the project. They were committed to having this performed there, and they wanted it to be no less grand than what they had seen in the video. So, People came from nowhere. People crawled out of the woodwork. People used to drive three hours to participate in rehearsals. People sponsored food for the entire cast, and they made Shanti happen. And when the curtain came down, although it, although it was a different cast, different group of people altogether, the energy that was generated behind the screen was the same as what we had experienced in Cincinnati. N then the invitations started pouring in. We got invitations to perform this kind of work and build community through music in places like Tampa, Houston, and so on and so forth. And in every place, the experience was the same. But I want to bring, bring it to your attention that this was not a traveling Broadway show. Each of these performances was locally generated with a local choir, a local orchestra, a local set of costumes, a local set of dancers, a local auditorium. Everything was local. 
But what was common to all these performances was the sense of energy and excitement that was generated at the end of the performance where people just wanted to cling on to what had been generated. They didn't want to let go of it even for weeks after the performance. And uh, in, in the words of many people, each of these experiences was like a family wedding with, each, with, with, with a separate photo album for each city. And the family only kept getting grow, growing bigger and bigger. As of date, I have worked with more than 2,000 people personally, and this work has been seen by, more than, by several thousand people so far, all around the United States. And uh, it was while, while working with Singapore that it occurred to me that what we were creating is an offshore development, onshore delivery, crowdsourced art model. It kind of sounds crazy, but that's what it is. There's also a go-live, like, which is associated with a technical product. So the final performance is a go-live where there's absolutely no scope for any error at all. But the difference is that there's plenty of grace and community and love that just flows through the auditorium when something like this happens. And we got a chance to perform in Washington, D.C., thanks to an invitation from the Hindu American Foundation. So guess where? We performed Chants for Peace on Capitol Hill. And then the World Choir Games came to Cincinnati. For about two weeks, the, all of Cincinnati was, was transformed into a huge singing space. There were about 350 choirs that came from around the world to sing here in Cincinnati. And we, the Greater Cincinnati Indian Community Choir, placed with two silver medals. And more encouraging than that, the next generation of our singers took it, up, took it upon themselves. So we had a Greater Cincinnati Indian Children's Choir, which performed side by side with us in the World Choir Games as well. And uh, we were covered on NPR. John Burnett flew all the way from Austin to Cincinnati to interview us and feature us on Morning Edition on NPR. Um, this is a picture from um, a performance we had in Europe. Um, I got a call from a friend in the Netherlands asking if we could create this experience there in the Netherlands with a Surinamese Indian choir. Now, Suriname is a little place down in the Caribbean. Um, so, um, the Surinamese Indians are those whose ancestors had migrated to the Caribbean as indentured laborers in, back in the 1800s to work in rubber plantations soon after slavery was banned. Their descendants moved to Holland and became Dutch citizens. So we built this choir of Surinamese Indians back in 2013, and last year we performed this work, Ragas and Symphony, that I wrote uh, with a combination of graduate students from the University, University of Delft, along with Surinamese Indian singers, and a Dutch choir, and a, a fantastic orchestra out there, and created the same energy and experience with record crowds. The only difference is uh, they all spoke Dutch. I don't know a single word of Dutch, but it did, didn't matter because our language's communication was pretty much music and music alone. So here we are, um, 20 years later and 10 cities later, um, back where we started here at Kresge Auditorium. Now our work is going on to TED and reaching a different domain. So when I reflect on what we have done, there's a few things that stand out. One is this work is about community and community alone. It's about being part of something much bigger than ourselves and celebrating something much bigger than ourselves. It is also about rising and reimagining ourselves and rising beyond our, uh, beyond our perceived limitations. There's a third thing that hits me too. Mark Twain once said, things happened 20 years later in Cincinnati. <laughs> but we were actually leaders in this 20 years ago. So we're just taking this work out to California this year. Okay. Then, um, what do I want to do, do with this work? I want to keep doing this forever and forever, for as long as I live. And, uh, but what would it take to create a structured, yet informal, spontaneous way for people to generate this intercultural singing? And what would it, would it leave people with? Well, I'm convinced, um, based on the last 20 years of experience, that, that when, diverse, when diverse, people, diverse groups of people work together with a shared sense of purpose, magic begins to happen. So I'm equally convinced that the world will be a different place if six, the concern of six billion of us shifted to a shared sense of purpose. A shared sense of purpose as described in an ancient poem in India, which translates to the following. May all, all be blessed with boundless joy. May all be free from needless fear. And in this world of harmony, may peace and joy prevail. 
It's my delight to share with you the last few minutes of a 20th anniversary performance at the Aronoff Center featuring this composition. Thank you very much.